Well, I'm kind of trapped in this video with Ryan. Uh, this is not a class on Shibari. I think he thinks this is a catchy intro. <laughs> but we're gonna show you knots in this episode because we like to cram too many things into one video in this How Not to Big Wall series. And this, ironically, is just a small part of the bigger project in the Big Wall Bible. You will find other people contributing thoughts and the way they like their rack and the way they go up things and what they cook and prepare for food, which I can smell your pizza right now. And so it's that's delicious, what's on my right? mind. It is great. Um, and so it's actually really cool. I'm actually really excited how this course has been going so mm -hmm. far as we've been filming, because mm -hmm. I think it's going to allow people to contribute information to double, quadruple what we're even providing. Yep. And I hope you guys are realizing that even amongst us, we do things in completely different ways. Super different. We, and we've never big walled together. Yeah. And you're going to, I think that's a blessing. Yeah. Because. Thank goodness. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, hopefully you've been doing things differently too and uh, staying safe out there while doing it too. Yep. And the overall theme across this entire uh, How Not to Big All course is to practice everything you can at home, which is 95% of what you're going to go do. How long did you sleep in your portal edge in Minnesota? Fun fact, I actually love big walling so much that I got rid of my bed for an entire year and just slept on my portal edge for an entire year just for fun. That doesn't sound like fun. You don't have to be that prepared, but I think you prepared, what, five years? For five years, yeah. So when he did his walls, he was successful, and I had a hard learning curve because I just showed up and struggled. In case for some reason this is the first video you stumbled upon on this channel because I had a clever thumbnail, uh, this is a A to Z content of the How Not to Big Wall course inside of a channel that has 400 other way more entertaining episodes on like the myth busters of like climbing gear. We break gear here for all extreme sports, mm -hmm. but sometimes our videos are going to be a little bit longer, which in that case will be all timestamp below. So you can skip around, skip past the knots if you know them, or is that how timestamps work? Yeah, I was like pointing to the timestamps that Got are down, down there. <laughs> <Got you>. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> and so we're just gonna cover what you're using in a big wall scenario. And we realized we couldn't do that without tying some knots. What do I have here or what do I have here? Oh, I don't know. Which what do you want to share first? Let's talk about this. There are two coalitions in South Dakota. On the western side is the Black Hills Climbing Coalition. On the east side is our coalition that we just started back in May called the Great Plains Climbing Coalition. Uh, if you'd like to check this one out, this is on the western side. They're doing great efforts in replacing old bolts uh, since the 1950s, doing a lot of conservation efforts uh, because with starting crags that are developing, uh, they need better trail maintenance and access issues, and the Black Hills Climbing Coalition's looking for donations. So check out their website and support a coalition that's not in your area. Crags don't develop themselves. Free content isn't free to make. Um, to contribute and give back in the way that you can. On this channel, you can get some merch at HowNotToSwag.com, and if 1,000 people or 1% of the audience donated $1 per episode, from the time I look like a big YouTuber to where I actually become a big YouTuber, this is financially viable. Right now, this is not financially viable and I literally go backwards every month to make this happen, but I'm so excited about what we're doing here mm -hmm. and what it could mean for the big wall community, slackline community, the caving and canyon communities, that it's worth transitioning because I know if I show enough value, I believe enough people will step up. Mm -hmm. Just like you guys in your coalition are gonna change enough of your area that people eventually step up, but it's a chicken and the egg sort of a thing. Yep. Rocky Talkie made an investment into what we're doing here because they also believe in this big wall course. And uh, Jeremiah and I spent about an hour before turning on this camera for this next section arguing about rope communication. I'm like, all of this is irrelevant if you can just go and say exactly what you mean. They even give you a 10% discount if you go to rockytalkie.com slash how not to. So I really, really appreciate what they're doing in this channel to help you guys out have this free content. Now, it's very good about practicing. We talk about that a lot. Take a rope and time yourself how fast, maybe 10 pieces of some cheap rope and lay it all out and see if you can play a game of how fast you can tie all these knots back to back to back to back. And if you can't do them all fast and bomber, then um, can you do it when you're tired, thirsty, stressed, and bonking? Can you do it with a blindfold on? Yes. Can you identify if your partner tied it right with a blindfold on? Or in other words, your head let and died. Mm -hmm. um, I've had to check if I was on um, rappel properly and I traced my finger and I was not in the, AT I was not in the carabiner. 
I only went through the ATC hole. I missed the clip. If I leaned back, I would have been dead. Um, my, my friend also did that. Mm -hmm. yeah. I did that too. Yeah, it's really good to be able to like, <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, Where do most accidents happen on uh, uh, It's coming down. It's on a rappel, yeah. so. It, it blows my mind in mountaineering. They made it to the top and then died. And you're just like, holy cow. So that, we're gonna have a whole video on um, bailing and getting off a wall. All right, let's get started on this anchor bill. I'm sick and tired of us talking. But this is how long it takes to do changeovers. That's very true. Not, not if you're climbing with me. Maybe if it takes you three days to get up Zodiac. <laughs> oh, <laughs> took him a day and a half. <laughs> I'm gonna show you a couple applications for overhand knots. Overhand on a bite would be to take a bite and instead of a figure eight, you're simply just sticking in that loop. It's a very simple knot. This is something I would do if I just wanna clip something to my harness um, just to hold up a strand of rope. I'm not gonna fix my partner with something like this. So you want 18 inches of tail when you're setting up to bail. So if you're doing, tying the two ropes you have together in order to make full 60 meter rappels, you want 18 inches of tail and then you tie just a simple, the simplest knot there is, an overhand. And that is called a EDK or an overhand knot. EDK stands for a European death knot. If you put enough force on this, this will unroll and it'll unroll and unroll and unroll until it slips. So it is sketchy if you don't have enough tail, but it's super good enough and I do it all the time. Another thing it does is it keeps it flat against the rock. And that is something that's nice. And it's an irregular knot, which means it's going to not get stuck in a crack as easily. So this is a sew and sling. It's also Dyneema. And this is a piece of nylon webbing. And there is a way to make this into a continuous sling. And it's called a water knot, which basically is a overhand knot. And then you follow it through. For some reason, they call it a water knot. And uh, technically it's a bend. I'm not mistaken because it joins two ends together. But it's specifically best for flat webbing, not ropes. And there you go. You got some two tails. And there is a beer knot that you can Google and you can eliminate the tails where they're stuffed inside of this tubular webbing. But that's not the part of this course that we care about. <laughs> Figure of eight. On a bite means you have a bite or a bend in the rope. And instead of coming around and doing what would be an overhand, is you go around one more twist and you go like this. And that is one thing you can do to fix uh, the person coming up. Now, if you wanna tie a figure eight on something that doesn't open, like either my harness as a way to tie in, I hope you know how to tie in <laughs> into a harness if you're doing a big wall, uh, or this ring, is I will do half the figure eight and then I will run it through that item trying to keep the audio to a minimum and failed miserably. And then I'm going to trace this and follow it all the way back through. And this is the kind of stuff you can learn at a climbing gym. But at least you know that this is also an eight. You wanna have at least a fist of tail. A way that I like to finish my figure eight is to take the tail, and sometimes I just don't like it dangling around, and this is more than a fist, so it's long enough is to continue to trace it. So it goes around like this, so I go around, and then it goes up, and so I go up. And the tail basically goes up, and it goes with your dress knot just fine, and that is called a Yosemite finish. One of my favorite types of figure eights is also on a bite, but you have a lot of extra rope here. Instead of putting the bite through the twisted hole here at the end, is you stick another bite through there, and then before you pull that rope all the way through, you flip it over itself, and those two strands are now the strands you're going to clip. And dressing your knot is just making sure that it looks nice and even and whatever. It makes it easier to untie later. It doesn't always affect the strength. Now I got two bunny ears. So what I can do with that is I can clip and equalize this by pulling this bottom strand and then boom. And they're mostly equalized, which is super good enough. This is not my favorite way to tie two ropes together, but it is in the eight family where you can trace that eight through one rope and you can do it and you can trace it with a different rope. 
And this is a safe way to join two ropes together. If you don't like the other ways we're gonna show you in this video, <laughs> cinch it up. Maybe dress it. If you don't dress it, the knot people will leave extra comments, which is great for the algorithm. So I'm gonna show a couple different series of a bowline. This one is my favorite, it's called a snap bowline. You have the uh, working end here, you're gonna pass through. And then with the standing uh, end, you're going to do a little twist in it. So notice that the standing end is the one that's on top right now. Then I'm gonna pass it behind the knot, creating a little bite. What I'm gonna do with the, the working end is to pass it through that bite and back to itself. Then you're gonna continue to hold on to the working end and then you're gonna pull the uh, other end down. Now this is a bowline without a backup and as everybody knows with a bowline, you must tie a backup. I'm gonna show my favorite when you have a shorter amount of tail here, how to do a backup. Uh, you're gonna take the working end over the band that's trapping it and you're looking into this triangle. So you're gonna pass it into the triangle and then back out towards the uh, standing end. And that is called a Smith's lock. Um, and that's a nice way to finish a bowline uh, with a backup with sh a short tail. When you don't have a short tail, but instead you have a long tail, doing something like a uh, fisherman's will suffice, which we will cover that in a little bit. So this is a nice way to finish and back up a bowlin. So the Yosemite bowlin is a very similar type of bowlin, right? But it's just a backup, it's a way to finish it. So all it is is you essentially still want to come out this back end. So you want to kind of follow it in the same direction that the, the rope is going. So because it's going around that way, I'm going to take the back end of the rope and go the back side and then back out towards the standing end. And there's your Yosemite backup. This one is not as secure as a Smith's lock. Smith's lock is really s slick and uses very little rope for that. Um, but the whole reason why I showed three different backups to a bowline is because a bowline, the positive of it is it's very easy to untie. The downside to a bowline is that it's very easy to untie, right? So with that, you really wanna make sure that you know how to back it up because if you were to use this as a, uh, uh, a way to fix your rope and it, they're jugging on it and it's going up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. Let's see if I can get it to eventually do it. Picking into it, so yeah. Let's see. You know, or even if it got caught on something very easily, it'd be very easy for the whole knot to then. There you yeah, go. <laughs> yeah. Another uh, risk with the bowline here is that if you uh, clip into it in the wrong location. You should not do what's called ring loading, which is actually clipping it in over here. And as you can see, is if I clipped up above, it can actually make the whole knot fail. So you wanna make sure that you're not clipping in up top to a bowl in there. It's just a way to be able to adhere the rope to the wall, but always make sure that there's a backup on it. This has no backup. The, the next bowline I'm gonna show is how to do a bowline on a bite. Uh, so it, you would need something to be able to clip it to. It's not something you run through. So a bowline on a bite is like an overhand knot. What you do with an overhand knot is it's just like a figure eight knot, but instead of coming all the way on the backside, you just go ahead and go all the way up. Then here's the trick, is the same strands that create the bite, as you can see, holding it up here, here's the bite, Here's the two strands. You're gonna to come towards those two and you're gonna pull those up. That right there still creates a bowline knot, but now you have a two-stranded rope. Not a redundant rope, but a two-stranded bowline. Very important to know that this is not redundant. You should still back it up and you can do a backup like this if you would like. Just a, a double finishing knot. Now we're gonna show you three similar knots that accomplish very different things. If you don't want to repel off the end of your rope, you need a stopper knot. You should do that all the time if you're climbing. 
What you're gonna do is take the working end of the rope and you're going to spin it around the standing end of the rope. And you do it two or three times and then you take the tail and you point it back down the direction it was and it creates this stopper knot. And that's what we call when we put this at the end of the rope. What's cool is if you make a bite first, where I do the bite, and then I take and I do the same thing around all of that, and I put the tail back down from where it originally came from, this is going to cinch down whatever you tied it to, keeping the minimal distance between the knot and the object you're tying to. It's one of the most difficult knots to untie once it's been loaded quite a lot. Um, and it's also called a, it's also called a slip knot if there's nothing in it. If I want to join the two ends of this rope or join two ropes together, I could tie what is called a fisherman's knot. And you could do a double or triple fisherman's. And that depends how many times you've wrapped around. What you do is you overlay these two working ends together and you basically, you guessed it, do the same thing. In this case, I'm only gonna do a double, but you have to do it on the other side, same thing. And you go once, you go twice, and you don't need any longer of tails than I have here. And when you pull the standing end, it pulls them together. Now it is nice when you get them to sit nicely with each other, but uh, dressing knots is more of a formality than it is complete safety, unless you're doing things like bolins. It's just, it's wonky otherwise. But this, I did a 700 foot rope swing on this. Problem is, I couldn't untie it when I was done, but I knew this knot and I liked jumping on it. So now I have a loop or a way to tie two ropes together. So now I'm gonna show you a butterfly knot that can be pulled in either direction and it still retain all of its strength. For, let's just start with a figure eight to show you what I mean about the, this problem it's solving. If these strands were here, you don't really wanna pull this knot this way or this not this way, you can see how janky it is. But wait, there's more. We have a solution for that. One way of tying that is to take the working strand and you wrap it very much like a stopper knot. What I'm going to do is take this middle one, and there's so many ways of doing this, and I'm gonna go down and through the hole. And now this is my clip in point and I'm going to dress the knot. Now you can make a butterfly knot all sorts of heights and sizes, but that is a butterfly knot. If I twist that, then this strand is going this way and this strand is going this way. And guess what? People think that matters and it doesn't. So now I can, or in a vertical world, pull this way on it, or I can pull this way on it. Now you technically can ring load this or pull on both directions. It's not super great for that, but it's not going to kill you. I'm going to rant real quick. I don't like to tie two ends with a butterfly knot with the tail sticking out because when I pull it to failure, the tails always slip through. Sometimes at a low force, sometimes at a high force, depends how long the tails are. I suppose the EDK does the same thing, but it's not that great of a bend, but it's an amazing tool for the midline of your rope and you can pull it up or down because sometimes you're pulling a bag up Sometimes your partner's pulling the knot down. Rant number 3,245. You can trust an alpine butterfly in this orientation when your rope is core shot. So right now it's holding my life just fine and I'm trusting it. And right now I'm 2,000 feet off the ground, right? Well, yes. I wanna show you right now that if I cut this while I'm on it and I'm core shotting this right now, Get away from your hand. I'm okay right now. <laughs> okay, okay so right now, you know, core shot, it's doing doing its job, right? Okay, uh, and now I'm really gonna actually cut the other direction. That even with me on the rope, it is still gonna hold me, which is the whole point of using the Alpine Butterfly also, is that when you get a core shot in your rope, it isolates that damaged spot, so you're able to keep going. Now this has to stay, stay intact for you to keep using the rest of the rope, but at least you can get back down to the ground when you're rappelling, or if it got damaged on a lower out, wild and over a sharp edge. So just kind of keep that in mind. Now, obviously, if this comes off and it's no longer weighted, you can see 
that the rope is dead, right, essentially at that point. But while it was cinched and tight, it will hold you. That doesn't mean that you want to go taking big old whippers off of it, but at least it'll hold you and you could rappel down and get off the route if you need to. So I'm gonna show you another way to be able to tie an alpine butterfly. It doesn't need to be in this orientation to tie it. But all I do is I take the strand and I create a bite really quick, and then I'm gonna rotate it two times around. One, two. And I'm trying to keep in mind the inside uh, circle I'm making. This is gonna go around the entire backside, and this hole that you're creating is where this bite is gonna go into. So you're gonna pass that back in there, tighten it down, and there's your alpine butterfly. This is the rope that was recently replaced on the death slabs of Half Dome, where you go directly up to the face from Mirror Lake. And I put a figure eight on this end, kind of a janky figure eight on this end. It's got a little gnarly spot there, but usually breaks here in the knot. I wanna see if, well, if this is bad. This is a uh, isolated twice to this butterfly. I did not tie this, I did not tie that. Oh, that's good. Oh, look at that. Oh my God, it's still alive. Oh my God. Oh, that was good. Oh, that was amazing. <laughs> that is not very high. Look at that graph. It's strong enough to ascend. Diameter rope used to be about 18 kilonewtons when it was new. I'm gonna show how to do a clove hitch two different ways. Uh, one with your ha two hands and one with one hand. So the first one that everybody knows is where you do the twist around and twist around and then tuck behind. You see that one a lot on Instagram. So that's the two-handed clove. You really wanna make sure to cinch it down and verify that it's cinched down before trusting your life to it. Application, uh, everything. I literally, do, <laughs> I use it literally for everything. Like my all time favorite one is a clove hitch. I understand that it's not a knot and that it's not as strong as a figure eight on a bite, but it literally does a great job and it's super good enough. All right, so the next one I like to do is a single handed clove. I, it's not totally single handed, but the big difference is Facing which way the gate is, uh, you want to take your hand, so if it's my right facing gate, my right hand is gonna come on the opposite side by the spine with my thumb facing downwards. Then I'm going to turn my thumb facing upwards and now where my fingers are, are what's gonna push it through the gate. And so that's a one-handed clove as well. So this is where an HMS or a pear-shaped carabiner comes in clutch, is it's very similar to a clove by doing a munter hitch. Uh, they're very similar, but there's just one slight difference here. So with a munter hitch, you can still start the, the munter the same way as you did the clove with the thumb down on the opposite side of the gate, so by the spine, come up, but instead of rotating it here where your fingers are, all you're gonna do is keep going and clip that. And that becomes a munter. So if I was to automatically start pulling on this, it's not gonna cinch, instead it's going to flip. And so that is a munter. On a big wall, the biggest application to a munter is for lowering out your haul bag or lowering out yourself on a piece. Um, I use this quite a lot on a big wall. It's like one of the most used things. So what I do for my munter, if I'm just doing it in my hand, is I start at the same as the clove again, rotate, but then I just go ahead and take this and I bring it up the back side. So you can kind of see it kind of creates that little loop there. So that's how I do my munter. 90% uh, of the time, that's actually how I do my munters. The, way, the reason why I like to do it that way is I can already reposition, so it's already in a correct flipping orientation, and that's why I like that. Uh, and what it does is it creates like a belaying opportunity with only the locker uh, for any uh, objects you need to move and belay, but without a belay device. The downsides to a munter is that it can put twist in the rope. To prevent the twist in the rope, so I'm gonna have it flip here so it'll be an easier orientation, is 
this strand that would be, uh, I don't know, this strand right here. This is, this is the loaded strand. You wanna come around on the front side so it looks very similar and then come up above and clip. And what that does is it still allows for the flipping opportunity, but any twist that you put into it, it'll automatically untwist the rope. It adds a lot of friction though, so just be aware of that. It's also a great way to use for when you're rappelling and you drop an ATC or your rappelling device. Uh, with this, because it is such high in friction, uh, it is very uh, diameter dependent. So if you use like an 11 millimeter rope, uh, it'll be a lot more friction and, and won't flip it as well or lower as well. So when you look at the differences between those two, you can see that this has a lot smaller saddle compared to the uh, HMS one. So never use a little one like this. Never use a D-shape. Don't use little beaners. Use big beaners if you're gonna use them in winter. This is an HMS carabiner or otherwise known as a pear-shaped carabiner. I'm gonna show how to do a girth hitch, which is very similar to a clove hitch, but the ropes are really just oriented in opposite directions. So what I do is I put them in my hands like this with my palms facing upwards. And then all I do is I turn my thumbs to face each other. So now you'll see the two strands are very close to each other. If you bring them together, that becomes a girth hitch. This is what a lot of people accidentally tie when they mean to do a clove hitch. This is not the same as a clove hitch. Is that a secure? Uh, no, and it will slip a lot uh, easier and uh, should not be used as a uh, way to tie your anchor. I hate master point girth hitches. I think they're awful and I, have, I think the clove one is way better. I'm gonna do a girth hitch with a single sling here because I'm gonna show another application here in a sec, is that you just pass the bite of the loop through and then pass it through that bite and there's your girth. This one I absolutely love as a way to conjoin two pieces together. Um, so I'm gonna pull and make sure that the uh, stitching is far away from where I'm gonna be tying this. Um, all I do is I take my big locker and I clip it to uh, essentially the whole thing. I'm gonna grab this strand with my thumb. I'm gonna push away, but I'm also gonna pull down with my fingers and where where my fingers are, I need to rotate my right hand so that nose can go where those fingers are. This is a nice way to be able to conjoin two pieces, but understand that this also does not have a shelf. So this is not clippable. This is not a shelf. This is your master point. It's just a metal master point, which means you can clip metal to metal. It's okay, people, to clip metal to metal. Metal touching metal is not the problem when you hear the phrase, metal on metal is bad. What happens is when you're linking draw to draw to draw to draw or carabiner to carabiner to carabiner to extend things, you extend things with slings. Because if things get twisted, what happens is you can basically, it's pretty reliable when I do it. Um, it puts on the gate, it opens it up. Soft on soft or ropes touching ropes is not bad. It's when a rope is rubbing over a rope is where a rope can cut another rope. So just understand these phrases that are kind of thrown around a little loose, that uh, soft on soft is bad and metal on metal is bad. This is why, and it's good to be aware of it. Since this is an anchor video, I wanna make sure it's very, very clear that you can't clip this because if something were to come off, fail or whatever, it's going to slide off and you will die. It's like the opposite of redundancy. It's 50% as reliable. If you are going to clip this in a way that is a sliding X, you twist one strand and you clip it and you can slide it back and forth. And when it, you know, if something were to happen, it's still attached. And that's something you really need to understand um, context. And something I don't think Jeremiah can muster because he doesn't like the anchor is a, it's pretty common to have people take this and then put it over the carabiner. But just so you understand, that's another way the girth hitch is made. And we did a video that showed that um, if a strand got cut and pulled hard enough, Dyneema is slippery and it'll all slip out and come undone. But usually the knot gets cinched up so much and you're not putting enough force on it, you're not gonna die. And usually what you're trying to prevent is if this piece blows, what's gonna happen is the carabiner's basically going to get jammed up in there. So it's super good enough. Uh, Jan Camus from Bliss Climbing 
has a lot of uh, solo climbing information. And what he did was he did the sliding X and then he put it through and that prevented the, the problem I invented to get a lot of clicks on my video. So um, don't worry too much about little nuances. This is just another quiver in your arrow. So this is a sliding X in a wide configuration, which is actually putting more force on the stuff. The more narrow these angles are, the closer the bolts are together, the more it's gonna share the load 50-50%, roughly. And the wider they are, is you're going to basically get a slack line <laughs> and it's gonna exponentially make the force. But honestly, it's not so exponential. You're going to blow like a bolt necessarily, but if you're putting a cam into this crack and a cam into this crack, it actually can make a difference. Now, what you don't wanna do, and if we're gonna make a big wall course, we gotta cover it, an American death triangle. Um, this had a lot of interesting uh, uh, myths around it, where this being 180 degrees, which in theory adds an infinite amount of force. That's not exactly how it works, and we have a whole video on why that is. Now, it, it is true that it adds more force in the system than the load you're putting on it. Does that matter? Not if you're just hauling or jugging, but it's like so much better. You're talking a 44 kilonewton anchor at this point, right? Because this is 20, 20 kilonewtons. This is 20, it's gonna break here. And this sling, if pulled just straight, is 22 kilonewtons. And you're only putting, let's say, one, two, three, four at the most on this kind of stuff if you're hauling and jugging or whatever. But you get 44 out of this, and then you're getting like not 44. Not quite redundant. If this gets cut, you're done. I guess if it, if it gets cut up here, you're done too. So the moral of the story, don't do this. Just don't even do it. Go check out our other video about it. Welcome to the world's smallest haul bag. I wanna dock this haul bag to here and I'm gonna use the munter that you saw earlier and then I'm gonna lock it off with what's called a mule overhand, a munter mule overhand MMO. I don't want to pull on this tail once I have it tied or it's gonna rotate. I want this to already be pre-rotated before I tie my mule, which is this loop that I'm going to go from behind and grab a bite and this is what's going to lock that off. And I pull enough bite in order to go around the whole thing and go down. If I went around twice, it would be very much like all those fisherman knots we showed you. That's not going anywhere. But when I wanted to go somewhere, because Jeremiah starts hauling this for the next pitch, then this being maybe 200 pounds sometimes, is I can't lift it to get it off my anchor. I could pop this and it can start to lower and I can belay it with this nice HMS carabiner that has the space and my bag can be lowered until it's fully on Jeremiah and when it's loose, uh, depending how long my tail is, I'll just let it repel off the end of the rope and it'll keep going. So that's where you see one of these knots actually applied in what you're going to see in our anchor setup. All right, I'm gonna show a docking system that's similar to Ryan's, but a little bit different. It's actually also very similar to a VT Prusik, or also compared to the Bela Scaper, it's gonna look very similar. It's actually called the Barber Pull, or also it's called the Load Release. Um, it's gonna start the same way, but instead it's gonna have two ropes. So you'll notice here that it is attached with a Super Bunny Ears, and then I have two strands that are of equal length. I'm going to be attaching it with a munter. So I'm gonna do my munter a little bit different than the way Ryan did it earlier. I'm gonna go on the, around the back side and then clip it through the front side. So that's where we're starting. There's the munter. Then I'm gonna take one of those strands and the other strand and have them on opposite sides and then cross against the front, cross around the back, cross around the front, cross around the back. And you're gonna do this uh, at least five times. Uh, the more heavy the bag is, you might want more. So uh, do as many as you need. Just keep going around the front and the back. 
But then to finish it off, you're gonna do what's called a square knot. So I do wanna show in detail, really close right here, the differences between a real uh, square knot and, I don't know, I don't know what the other one's called. But you'll start it off by just doing a simple overhand like that. And then a square knot is not this. This is not a square knot. Well, you'll notice is notice that this strand is on top and this strand is now going down below. That is not correct. A square knot needs to go the other direction. Instead, you'll notice that these two strands are now touching each other and these two strands are touching each other. This is a square knot. It'll cinch as it gets pulled apart. And then always lock that down for the troll patrol. So that's my docking system that I use, uh, but then it's also very similar to what Ryan does when it is ready to do a lower out. You undo the square knot, slowly undo the barber pull, keep on going. Keeping a firm hand, you don't wanna let it go because it, it at this point is just being held on with friction. That is what's holding it right now. Um, and then once you get really close, you really wanna make sure you have a really good firm hand And then same thing, the bag will get lowered off, but it has just more friction than a single strand than what Ryan had, but also very similar idea. It would get lowered off, and then the bag goes whoosh. Hope it doesn't go whoosh. Something went real wrong. <laughs> so I'm gonna do a uh, three different friction hitches you can use, and this is really well for an adding any type of friction, grabbing onto things. If you drop your sender, you might need to use one of these to go up your fixed rope. So uh, you can take your Prusik loop and what you're gonna do is you're gonna pass it around the rope and I always grab my knot or my stitching and the stitching is what's gonna be passing through. So this bite part, it's gonna go inside. One, two, and three. And it all depends on the diameter of the rope and how many uh, uh, wraps you need. If you want to check out that episode on how not to highline, I believe that they do do a diameter and Prusik loop diameter uh, and what they release at and get caught at. So check that one out. So uh, that is our standard Prusik. The nice thing is it, it grabs in both directions. So it'll go up and down. And the only way that it'll be able to go down is if you push down. If you pre cinch it too hard, it will get stuck so bad that you can't release it very nicely. Mm, yeah. Your face was <laughs> worth that whole thing. Uh, I bet. Whether or not that was helpful for anybody. <laughs> okay, so there's our Prusik. Uh, next one is gonna be your climb heist. Um, so this one, very similar, but you're gonna be starting at the top, but instead of going inside the loop, you're just gonna be wrapping it around the rope. So one, two, three, and then the knot part, is gonna go up through that loop. And there's your climb heist. Now this one is really nice for a one directional pull. So in this direction, it, once it cinches down like this, it won't go down, but it is easy to push up if you need to. So it is kind of a nice one for that. Like in the center without teeth. Correct. All right, now this one is very, very similar. So just watch how I undo this knot and we'll go from a climb heist to an auto block. So all I have to do is it goes back up, it comes out of that hole, but instead, now you just clip them. And there's your auto block. Ooh. Now this one, I personally don't really like an auto block, but it is helpful if you just need to add friction, but it is not one that I would want to trust my life to. It is one just to add good friction, but you would add your carabiner to where my finger is right now, and yeah, it might be able to add just enough friction where you have more control on your rappel but it would not hold your life in a life-saving scenario. There's what's called the VT Prusik. And to do another plug, go check out this channel, gotta or this episode. Point higher. Okay, you gotta check out this episode about VT Prusiks. <laughs> <laughs> I still want you to go watch that VT video, but I'm gonna give you a little sneak peek. Brent introduced me to this hitch, and Brent made this wall. And he let us film this entire course, even while he was out having so much fun on a salmon river uh, trip that we could still come here and film while he was gone. So I really appreciate him. 
not only for letting us film here, but showing me the VT Prusik. What's kind of cool about doing this channel is we're cross-pollinating the other sports, all kind of interconnected. For some reason, some ideas don't get transferred over the gaps. And so by breaking gear fear for all extreme sports, I get requested to test the VT Prusik when I have never really seen big wallers uh, do this. And this is an amazing thing. Now, note, this is two sewn ends rather than a loop. But if I go around three times and then start this crisscross pattern of a braid, and it's not a lot you know, going for it other than just, you see how that was longer? I just wrapped that a little bit more. Then I can take a carabiner and there's not enough friction maybe that I'd want. This will hold, but if I want more, I would take this off and I would crisscross it one more time and connect it in the back of the rope. And now I've got plenty and it goes up super easy. I'll flip this around. You pull down really hard and I'll touch that. So when you touch this, just so you know, you want to smoke the cigar. You never want to grab it because if you panic, you'll just start to fall. And what's cool is you can install this while it's loaded. So if someone's stuck on rappel down there and maybe unconscious and there's no second rope, um, there was a party in Zion, in Zion that couldn't get down because the belayer went underneath the thing. They couldn't get back up. They couldn't get to him. They had one rope. And so basically this, I'm ready. I'm ready. <laughs> Barely having to touch it. I would not use just one of these to go down to my belayer. I'd use probably two or one and like move an ascender one inch as I went down because um, it is just scary. But this is a solution. And this is what I carry even on my gym harness because it's like an ascender in all the things that you can do with this thing. Um, I can also put it upside down and pull up with it. That's an option too. Yeah, because what I like is I don't even, I don't have to two hand it, I just lift it. Yeah. And you can check out in our video when it slips, on what diameters, and what it happens when you heat up this VT Prusik from Blue Water, uh, because as a Technora sheath and won't melt. Um, this is moving along the rope, so it's always touching a new spot on your rope, but it's touching the same spots on here, on the actual Prusik. So um, it's a really great material, it's a high tech stuff, and um, I think it's worth having. Yeah, that's pretty It cool. has two kilonewtons on this. It got so hot it melted the nylon on the inside to the point it turned to liquid and came through the sheath. Oh! <laughs> like, look at that. I lost all the color in my hands. Oh my god, shit. <laughs> They're purple. They're purple. That is not... That was... That was... A, Bad idea, that was really good. <laughs> there we go. Wow, dude. Maybe I should go first. Yeah, uh, no, you're good. My hands are, are defined. I think that's such a funny intro.